Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker with A Healthcare Z, healthcare finance education, and this is the How to Sell in Healthcare podcast, episode two, where we are going to talk in more detail about prospecting. So at the end of episode one, we talked about the process of seeds, nets, and spears by small group, mid-market, and national accounts for prospecting and we're gonna so we're gonna still talk about that and we're gonna take it uh, industry segment by industry segment so we're gonna start with small group and the prospecting for small group really does not involve directly prospecting the employer but rather prospecting the broker because as we talked about it's really the broker that drives a lot of the decision making for groups on under 100 and I would say this even applies to the majority not all but the majority of mid-market employers as well so what I say for prospecting um, in regards to seeds nets and spears is really going to be um, true for essentially all of small group and I would say probably 75% of the mid-market. And the reason for that is because many of the individual broker producers within an insurance brokerage will have a book of business where they'll have a mix of both small group and mid-market clients. And so by working with that broker, they're going to then bring you into their small groups and their mid-market groups as opposed to, well, if you go just go straight to the mid-market group, well, then you don't have that relationship with the broker who's then going to bring you into the small group. So you can kind of get two birds with one stone, if you will, by approaching the broker and the account manager in the brokerage space. Now, in specifically in regards to the seeds, nets, and spears, and again, the seeds are your Rolodex, the nets uh, is, your, uh, is your outbound sort of mass prospecting, and your spears is your more uh, targeted, focused, um, customized prospecting, is that it's really the nets that are going to be what you use for small group and mid-market. You're going to use spears for the national accounts, and then you're, you're obviously going to use your Rolodex with whatever you have. If you have a Rolodex, I started out without a Rolodex, without any seeds. So let's just talk about this in regards to no Rolodex, because if you don't have one, you can still be successful. So the, um, the process for prospecting involves interruption by email, interruption by phone, and interruption in person. And in order to interrupt, you have to uh, interrupt, uh, you have to have people to interrupt. You have to know who these people are. And Aaron Ross in his uh, books talks about just locating the people, finding out who to talk to in and of itself is difficult. It's like at least 50% of the battle. So in other words, we're going to talk about list generation. In order to have people to email and people to call and people to meet with, you have to have a list of those people. Who are these people? And here's how you find those people. You go to, you, one, you use LinkedIn. And you, uh, through your own, whatever connections you have, one, you just, whatever seeds you have, you just want to connect with everybody on LinkedIn that you've ever met in your life. And then what you can do is you can look at and that's a that's a a, uh, a first degree connection in LinkedIn. And what you can do is you can look at your second and third degree connections. In other words, the first and second degree connections of all your first connections you can then view. And you can see you can't they don't give you their phone number and their email address, but they give you their name and they give you where they work and they give you their job title and they give you the city where they work. So. What you do then is you go, you need, you need a list of insurance brokerages. Okay, so some, maybe you know them, maybe you don't. What you do is you go to the Business Insurance Magazine and you get the list of the 20 largest insurance, two, excuse me, 200 largest insurance brokerages in America. And you're going to go through and you're going to search your LinkedIn contacts by that brokerage. So let's just use Arthur Gallagher or AJG or Gallagher, Gallagher Benefit Services as an example. And it's hard because that firm goes by those three different names. So you have to use those three different search terms and that's going to be your keyword search term. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, you, and you don't even need the special version of LinkedIn to do this. You can just do this in the regular version, the free version of LinkedIn. And then what you're going to do is you're going to then um, search that up by geographic area. So it's going to give you 10 connections or 100 connections or 1,000 connections depending upon how large your individual your personal network is so your personal network might be 250 people your second degree network might be 10,000 people and your third degree network might be a hundred thousand people and so you're not going to want to have all those people you're going to want to have them by geographic area so you're going to want to look them up and you can look them up by Atlanta by Dallas Fort Worth by Houston by Nashville by Chicago by New York City etc so 
let's just start and say, okay, well, we want we just want to find Arthur Gallagher brokers that are in Atlanta. So you're going to type in AJG Arthur Gallagher Gallagher Benefit Services as the keyword in three separate searches. Then you're going to set the location as Atlanta, and then you're going to set it as only your second and third degree, uh, well, first, second, and third degree connections. And your first degree connections might be zero if you don't know anybody there, but you might have second and third degree connections. Now, here's the challenge: is that most brokerages sell both employee benefits and property and casualty. And so it's going to bring up the property and casualty people. And you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to email them. You don't want to meet them. Uh, It'll be a nuance to them. And so what you need to do is you need to separate out the employee benefits people from the property and casualty people. There are a few ways of doing that. One, the property and casualty people will oftentimes have a professional designation of CIC after their name. So you do not want the CIC people. Um, the employee benefits people sometimes will have a CEB, CEBS designation. Sometimes they'll have an RHU designation. Sometimes they'll have an SPHR designation. Um, sometimes it'll just say uh, VP, uh, employee benefits producer or EB producer. It'll actually say that in their job description. So you're going to want all those people and you want the account managers too. You don't just want the producers, the VP of so-and-so. You also want the account managers or the account executives as well. And then what you're going to do is you're going to write those names down in a spreadsheet. You're going to do the columns are going to be as follows: first name, last name, and then for the uh, and then the brokerage AJG, and then the location Atlanta, and then you're going to put down their role, either producer or account manager, and you want to have that be either one or the other, and then you're going to have the. Um, and then you're going to have a column then where you're going to fill in their email address. And you're going to do that because you understand the format of their email address is first name underscore last name at blank.com or it's first initial last name at blank.com or first uh, first name dot last name at blank.com. However, it's structured so that and so that you can actually do a formula so that it auto populates with the first and the last names to create those email addresses. It's called concatenate is the function. So you concatenate to create the emails. And then what you do is you just go on the internet and you find what the main telephone number is for that particular office. Um, and then you just, you, you don't need to find everybody's extensions. Don't worry about that. Cause all you're going to do is call the receptionist and ask to talk to Joe or Jane or whatever anyway. So then you're going to, your final com is going to be that same phone number for all those people with Arthur Gallagher in Atlanta. And then you're going to have some sort of CRM that you're going to use to manage all of your contacts and your follow-ups. And we use salesforce.com. It's very easy. You can buy an individual plan uh, for $50. And if your brokerage like doesn't pay for it or they don't have one, then just pay for it on your own. It's super cheap and it's easy to use. There's a gazillion YouTube videos that show you how to use it. And you're going to then uh, go through. And so you find you do AJ, G, Arthur J. Gallagher in uh, in Atlanta. And then you're going to do a number you can do, and then you need to break it down by a number of ways. So if you specifically have a geographic territory and your geographic territory, let's say is just Atlanta, then obviously you're not going to look for Arthur Gallagher in other cities, but then you're going to look for, let's say USI in Atlanta. And then you're going to look for other, let's say McGriff in Atlanta. You're going to go through all these different, uh, brokerages in Atlanta and you're going to keep populating that Excel spreadsheet and then you're going to do a mass upload to Salesforce. And I literally did this every morning from about 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., Monday through Friday, and I could generate about 250 names a week. So that's about a thousand a month. And I did it straight for 10 months to create a list of 10,000 names. Now it wasn't 10,000 names in one city. I was doing it nationwide. Um, But I would say that that process of list creation needs to be done by you yourself. Do not buy a list, in my opinion, because we we bought some lists at Compass, and I will tell you that the quality of the information on the list was horrible. Uh, it was a huge waste of time. You ended up aggravating a bunch of people. Um, you were getting a ton of bounced emails because people leave. They change jobs or they just never had a good email address to begin with. So I would not buy a list, and it is you know time intensive. But look, if you just do it for two hours a day, five days a week for a month, you got a thousand people. I mean, that's a sizable list. You can do some damage with a thousand names. So, you know, to, to have to quote unquote, wait for a month, I mean, it's not a huge deal. You know, if you want to work more than two hours a day, then do it. You can get it done faster. So you, you're going to create that list, right? And then what you're going to do is, so, so fine. So you're go, what you're going to do is then you're going to need to, to, call, to email those people and you're going to need to call those people. Okay, let's take a step back. Let's say you don't have enough people in your LinkedIn network to actually effectively find a, a decent number of people. 
with Arthur Gallagher, USI, blah, 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 in Atlanta. Well, then you need to meet those people and connect with them on LinkedIn. And so this is where you're going to look up the SPHR, the, you know, or excuse me, you're going to look up the SHRM, you're going to look up the, the, the web chapter, if there's, if there's World of Employee Benefits in your, in your town, you're going to look up the SEBS chapter, you're going to look up the Business Group on Health chapter, and you're going to go to their monthly meetings. And your job at that monthly meeting is not to sell anything or promote anything. Your job is just to meet people and ask other people about themselves, and you can t- ask them about what they're selling and what their work is like. You can talk about their dogs. I love talking about pets. It's a wonderful thing to talk about. And then you're going to exchange business cards and then you're going to go home or in the parking lot and you're going to connect with that person on LinkedIn and they're going to connect with you because you met them. It's not some sort of stranger. And so once you do that, then you're going to go, going to go back and, and redo your Arthur Gallagher shirts. You're going to redo your USI search because now you have more second and third degree connections because you just connected with that third, with that person as a first degree connection. So you need to go through that process. And it took me like a year of going to these events to get my initial like LinkedIn contacts. I only knew like 250 people in my life. Okay, so I had like 250 LinkedIn contacts. And it took me like a year just to meet like another 250 people to get it over 500, right? Once you get to LinkedIn 500 plus, it was like, that was my goal, just to get to where it said 500 plus. So it it takes a long time to meet these people, but you would just meet every single person humanly possible. So and it, even if that means going to like national conferences, because what will happen is, is that if you meet somebody at a conference and like, you know, and I don't, you know, it, you know, you know, we're, we're recording this during the age of COVID. So to the extent that the conference doesn't exist anymore, you're just going to have to wait until you can do things in person. But you just need to connect with these people. And even if they're not in your area, it's okay because if they work at Arthur Gallagher in Chicago, there's a high likelihood they're going to be connected to some Arthur Gallagher people in Atlanta, even if Chicago is not in your territory. So you still want to connect with them. So um, so you've done this list creation, okay? Now you're going to do a combination of emails and phone calls out to them. Now um, if you're using Outlook, which most people do for their email, you know, Microsoft actually has a, a policy against you can't like spam email people out of your Outlook, right? And so if they see that you're sending repetitious emails, the same email out to different email addresses, like they're going to ding you for that and potentially, you know, suspend your license. So you can't do that. So you have to use some sort of email service. Um, I personally use MailChimp, but there's other ones out there. The reason that I use MailChimp is because it's the largest one. And so because they're so big, they have to work very hard to make sure that their email list does not go to junk mail because their entire business is based upon their emails not going to junk mail, but actually going to people's in- email inboxes. So, and it's, it's actually free to start. So you get up, you know, you get like several thousand contacts, like 500 or 2000 contacts to start where they don't charge you any money to send out those emails. But they're going to take care of the federally required like uh, notice at the bottom. You have to have an address. You have to have a way of unsubscribing. I mean, Mailchimp's going to take care of all that for you, so that you're compliant with your emails. And then what you're going to do is you're going to send. And this is an Aaron Ross thing. You're not going to send out more than 50 to 100 emails a day. So you don't want to send. You know, if you've got a list of a thousand people, you don't send out a thousand email in a day, a thousand emails in a day. You want to send out like 50 to 100 in a day. You want to do a smaller amount. And in your uh, in your in your content of that email, the the most important part of that email, you're going to use that same formula that I talked about in episode one of interrupt, engage, educate, offer, interrupt, engage, educate, offer. OK, so what are the ways that you're going to interrupt? One, you're going to interrupt with the subject. OK, and then you're going to interrupt with the time of day. Right? So that is those two things, the time of day that you send the email and the subject of your email are more important than what you actually say in your email. So before you sweat the contents of your email, the time of day and the subject line are super important. Okay, let's talk about time of day. People get, you know, it's like running a marathon. People get burned out of email. So you do not want to email people, in my opinion, any later than 10 a.m., so all your emails, and what, what what you can do is obviously is you can set the time so that it's delivered, but you want to set the email time so that it's in the morning, okay? Whether it be, now some people want to do it early, they want to do it like six, some people want to hit them as soon as they get into the office like nine, but I would not email anybody after nine o'clock uh, because by the time, if, if they get an, after, an email in the afternoon, they've already gotten 200 emails and they're so burnt out from email, they don't want to answer any more emails. So believe me, do not do it late in the day. Two, don't do it late in the week 
and don't do it on the weekends. Some people like to email on the weekends. I think that's protected time. I think that's rude to pull people away from their family. Uh, and so don't do it, in my opinion. So think about everybody's email lives by Thursday or Friday. They're so burnt out that they do not want to look at another email. So don't email people on Thursday or Friday. Do it Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before 9 a.m. That's the best time to email people. So if you're doing 100 emails a day, that means that you can get out like 300 a week. All right. So if you're doing 300 a week, then you don't necessarily email people weekly, right? Because you're going to wait maybe do a different batch of 300 in week two. And as things change, then maybe you're going to want to do an email batch at 6 a.m., an email batch at 7 a.m., an email batch at 8 a.m. Maybe you're going to want to over time increase it to more than 50 to 100 emails a day. But in the beginning, you're only going to want to do 50 to 100 emails a day. So you're talking like 300 a week. Maybe you can expand to Thursday. Okay, if, if you can expand it all, I'll give you one more day of the week. So time of day. Okay, now let's talk about the subject line. The subject line should always have a number in it because and it should never have a platitude like great or awesome. It should never have the word value in it. It should never have the word um, quality in it. It should never have the word um, – all these what are all these superlatives – Never use those. You want to use numbers. Um, numbers are eye-catching because most email subjects don't have numbers. So you want to use numbers to sell. And then you want to also make your email subject lines somewhat mysterious, and you want to make them incredibly short. Uh, you also want to have the words in those emails have the first letter of each word be capitalized, right? Because it's like a headline in a newspaper. Headlines in newspapers are not written in lower caps. I wouldn't do all upper caps because sometimes it's kind of annoying to read. Um, but I would, you know, use numbers, capitalize the first letter, make and in, and look at your email. Uh, because email is mostly read on your on phones. So look at the email on your phone and make sure the phone doesn't cut off your subject. So depending upon the length of the word, you can get away with anywhere from kind of four to six words. So it's got to fit within those four to six words so it doesn't get cut off on the uh, subject line. Okay. Next, on, in the body of the email, the font should be at least 14-point font and never use italics because italics are hard to read. So you want to use 14.5 because if you, you want to look at this email on your um, phone because that's how they're going to be reading it. It's on your phone. They're going to be meeting. They're going to be bored. They're going to be scanning through their email on their phone. So you're going to want to have your email to be easy to read. If you do the standard 11-point font, that might be kind of hard to read. So you want to do it in a um, you want to do it in a larger font, and you want to make sure you have plenty of white space. Okay, so you're not going to do long prose and paragraph. Literally, you're going to do short sentences. You're going to have a full, like, blank space. In other words, two returns, blank space of white space in between. You're going to use uh, things like bold and underline to accentuate the text. And you're going to make that um, email no more than three or four sentences. And again, you're going to follow that pattern of interrupt. So the interrupt is the timing in the subject line. Then engage is the very first line. And by engage, I mean you use their first name. And if that involves you know, setting up the email blast such that it pulls in a field to put their first name in, do it. So you don't want to ever leave out their first name. Or if you need to like manually send them out through individually through uh, MailChimp or whatever service you're using so that your, their first name is in there, do it, okay? So you want to address them by their name. You just don't want to send a blanket um, thing in there, okay? Um, next up, that very first line, as you can imagine, needs to be the engagement part. And so it specifically needs to address a problem that they have. So it's not, it's not solution-based, it's specifically based upon their problem, and it needs to be a specific problem. So obviously when you're selling to employers, everyone's like, healthcare costs, healthcare costs, healthcare costs. I would argue you would never use the word healthcare cost because it's such a general term that it's, it's, it's just, it, it's become a cliche. So you don't want to use that. So what you want to do is you want to point out some sort of hidden area of cost that maybe they didn't realize that they were getting shellacked by. That's what you want to do. OK, and uh, or, or or whatever area it is, it could be in mental health, it could be in, you know, areas related to, um, you know, quality. You're not going to use the word quality again because it's cliche, but it could be related to that. That's fine. OK, and then 
you're going to have, you know, one or two body paragraphs. And then the call to action is you're just going to ask for a five minute phone call. That's all you want to do. And when you ask for the five minute phone call, you're going to specifically state a date and a time. You're not going to leave it open ended of, Hey, I just want to connect with you some point next week. No, you're going to say, Hey, are you available? And typically I would put it out. If I, if I'm emailing out Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, I would put it out for Thursday or Friday. And I would be like, hey, are you available on um, – and I would do it until Friday at 1. A lot of people cut out early on Friday. So I, so Friday mornings – Thursdays and Fridays were my call times. So I loved calling on Thursdays. Thursday afternoons and Friday mornings were my favorite times to call. So and – I, and I would set up sort of pre-scheduled calls and then I would cold call whenever I didn't have uh, uh, scheduled call times. So you say, hey, are you – are uh, – can we get on the phone for five minutes on Friday? And then you always do it in their time zone if you're not in their time zone. Can you do it uh, on – can you get on the phone for five minutes at 9.30 on uh, Friday, you know, 4.23 or, you know, whatever the date is? So you're going to have a specific time. And what they're going to do then is that then doesn't – they don't have to you know, think, look at their calendar and be like, oh, where does it fit? They can just look in there. And what they're going to do is they're going to say either yes, I'm interested and yes, I have time or they're going to say no, I'm not interested or they're going to say yes, I am interested but I don't have time then. And then what they can do is is they can just – they'll just reply, I can't do then. Which is awesome because if you got a reply that says I can't do then, that means that they actually do want to talk to you but they can't just do it at that time. So then I would go a little bit more open and I say, okay, so fine. So how about the following Monday, you know, 426 or whatever the date is um, at 830. And I would try to get them uh, early in the day because because people are constantly fighting fires. So you try to want to you want to try to get people before they have the fires come up and. Um, and, uh, you know, we could talk in another episode more about the email writing, but you're going to you're going to email them. OK, so fine. So you send them an email. Guess what? Your email and what you're going to measure your email open rates and your response rates so that you're going to you're going to test lots of different content. You're going to have no idea what subjects work. You're going to have no idea what days and what times work, but you're going to do a ton of testing, especially around the subject and the body and the call to action. So you're going to do a ton and ton and ton of testing around that. And your. Um, you, okay, and and then the best time of there's also a time of year to best do this. So the the best time of year to do this is January through June, and or the end of May. Say end of May, beginning of that's the best time to do it because that is when brokers are not you know busy doing their you know renewals and yada yada yada, and then a lot of them take time off over the summer. At all sorts of various different times, so you get like vacation, you know, time problems, et cetera, et cetera. You can still go through the summer, so you can still make hay through the beginning of September. Really, the ideal time is January through um, June. Now, what you can do is you can even start as early as the last two weeks of December, because that's when all their groups are kind of said and done, and they're just wrapping up open enrollment, blah blah blah. But then your call to action is not to talk to them in December. Your call to action is, hey. Can I, I want to talk to you after the first of the year. Can we talk on January 2nd at, at 4 p.m. or whatever it is? Um, so, um, and you're going to test lots and you're going to look at your email open rates and you're going to look at your response rates to see what types of content is resonating. Okay, so you're going to be, you're going to be a sort of an email creating machine. I probably created well over 200 different types of emails over the years. Um, and oftentimes the emails that I thought were awesome got horrible responses. And the emails that I thought were just kind of meh, they actually got really good responses. I would do some emails that were just two lines long. It would be subject, hi, Joe, or hi, Jane. And then sometimes it would just be like, can I talk to you next Friday at 4 p.m.? And it would be super short. And it would just have... Uh, and then, okay, on the greeting, on the, you know, your signature at the end, you got to make the signature at the end look good. You just don't want to have some sort of dinky signature. I put my picture in this signature so that people can see what you look like. There's just something confirmatory that makes sure that you don't have like three eyes or something like that. You want to use a variety of colors in that signature. You want to have the font be big in your signature. You want to, I had my name in red 
and then the company's name was in blue. I had the company logo in there. I had my picture in there. So your signature needs to look really good. You don't just want to have some little dinky black and white signature. Um, so you need to have a good, like, it, it, it almost looks like artistically good uh, signature, okay? It has to look impressive. So, okay, so fine. So you've got that out there, and then you're like, okay, guess what? Email open rates, sub 10%. Response rates are, pro- you're pro- you know, maybe you're going to get a 2% response rate, okay? So we're talking maybe double-digit email open rates, and you're talking low single-digit response rates, okay? That's to be expected, okay? Just know that's how it is. If you're not doing anything wrong, that's just the way it is. So then what you're going to do is you're going to send a second email. And the reason that you're going to use a CRM is because you have to keep track of what emails you've sent. So you're going to log. And there's ways to do this so that it'll automatically log in in Salesforce um, through an API from MailChimp. Or, you, frankly, I would just hand enter it. And I had, like, two-word descriptions of the email so that I knew what date I was sending what I sent what email on and you get into this rhythm where it's really fast to do it so just document you don't have to spend a gazillion days documenting it but you do need to document it in Salesforce if you do it it needs to go in Salesforce if you do it it needs to go in Salesforce everything I don't care if it's one letter for like the very first word of like you know HLM WB for had lunch meeting with Bob. Like do that, okay? Because you have to document it, right? So that's that's the next thing. Now, after two emails, guess what? The vast majority of the time, you're not gonna get a response. So then you're gonna call them, and after let's say a couple of weeks, you're gonna call them on a Thursday or Friday, and you're just gonna leave a voicemail. And we'll talk about what the contents of that voicemail is later. But you're gonna leave a voicemail, and like you're never gonna, no one's ever gonna answer, but occasionally they will. All right, so you're going to leave cold voicemails, and in those cold voicemails, you're going to actually going to reference the emails that you've been spent sending. So with that, I'm going to pause for today, and then we'll pick up on episode three next. Thank you so much.